Next, we'd like to welcome Mark, who's another prominent author. And Mark is, a, is an a expert in helping build challenger brands, so new companies taking on the establishment. And he's got quite a number of his own interesting life stories, and we'll see which of them we get to here. Mark is also going to be doing one of the workshops this afternoon, so we can get more of him then. And this book is pr among the most promoted, I'd say, by Vinod. So uh, pretty much everyone Vinod meets gets told to read this book. So now we get to hear from the author himself. Come Thank on up, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm going to dispel a, a rumor that I wrote this uh, book, Eating the Big Fish, that you have in your bag. I've written a book. It's not in your bag. Vinod prefers this one. I don't know why, but there we go. So. Challenge your brands. Take a look at that image, as unpleasant as that may be, so early in the morning, and identify which of those roles you have. <laughs> I think it's going to be pretty helpful to you to identify with our little fish here, to mix a metaphor. Uh, classically, in challenger brand thinking, this is us against an enemy, right? This is the Pepsi the, uh, versus Coke, the Cola Wars or it's Mac versus PC. But it doesn't have to be. Since we started studying challenger brands 17 years ago, we've expanded our definition. This may be you taking on an entire industry, alternative forms of meat, for example. Uh, Nest taking on the entire HVAC si um, home system and how we think about that. Could even be even larger than that. Could be something in culture. If you're familiar with the Dove brand, they're challenging the beauty myth the stereotype that we have about what makes women beautiful, Dove, a soap brand, deciding to take that on on behalf of its audience. So there are all kinds of different ways for you to think about framing your story against a big fish, the central challenge, the thing you must take down in order to win. It is not, being a challenge brand is not simply about uh, the state of market, you being smaller than the big fish, met lots of small companies who aren't actually challenger brand because they don't have the mentality. So we've come to think about the critical definition of being a challenger brand is when your ambition, A, significantly exceeds the resources you have available to meet those ambitions, and you are prepared to accept the implications of the gap between those two things. So what this presentation is going to be about is about what are the implications of those gaps. So a little bit about eBig Fish. We are 17 years old. My uh, uh, partner, Adam Morgan, coined the phrase challenger brand to describe businesses that he'd spotted that were seeming to punch above their weight, do more with less. Despite being small and diminutive in stature, they were able to take on and challenge the big guys. And we study challenger brands and have been doing for the last 17 years. There's, uh, uh, the body of our work is called the Challenger Project, where we will go out and meet with CEOs, CMOs, like people like yourself, who are being able to do more with less, who are being able to punch above their weight. And we say to them, what is it that you're doing? And we study uh, soft drinks, financial services, technology, personal care products, and we write about the commonalities that we find in these books. So eating the big fish defines the eight credos of challenger brands, the eight repeatable patterns that any of you in this room can look at and apply to your own business. How do we create a different challenger strategy? Equally, it's important to think about the personal qualities of the people that you hire and the kinds of cultures that you build. And this came up a number of times uh, yesterday, with people talking about culture and just how important it is to sustain and continue to power a challenger brand. We call that the pirate inside, pirates versus navy. Overthrow defines the 10 different kinds of challenger brands. It gives you an opportunity to look at the different flavors of challenger and try and see which of those uh, works for you best. And then the book that came out last year, A Beautiful Constraint, How to Turn Limitations into Advantages. So those are the challenger playbooks. They define these common practices that we see showing up again and again and again when we interview and spot challenger brands in the world. And I want to share some of that uh, with you. Four themes, and this is the structure of this presentation. We'll refer back to these four themes as I tell you some stories about challenger brands. The first thing that challengers seem to do really well is they embrace intelligent naivety. 
challenge is very often unencumbered by experience. If you think about uh, Reed Hastings blowing up the movie rental business, or even Jeff Bezos going into uh, books and ultimately what Amazon has become, no experience directly in the category, and that gives them an ability to step back and see that category with intelligent naivety and introduce a new criteria of choice into the category. If you're competing with the big fish, you cannot beat them on the terms that they are dictating. You have to introduce a new criteria of choice into the category by which you can win. We'll look at some of those examples in a moment. Secondly, you must become the thought leader in the category. There are two kinds of leadership in any category, the market leader, the biggest, the thought leader, the one with all the ideas. How do you become the thought leader? You do it by strategically breaking the conventions of the category. All categories have codes. This is what it looks like to market a bank, to market a server, to market an airline. We're going to look at what that looks like. We're going to flip some of those on its head. We're going to do something very different. And you're going to signal to the world, pay attention, world. We are the thought leader. You don't just do this randomly. You do this from a very strong point of view. Your beliefs about the world, what change you're trying to make happen. We call this the lighthouse identity approach to making a brand. Brand leaders go out and do market research, and they mirror back to customers what the customer wants. We heard you talk about more caffeine in your coffee at 9 o'clock in the morning after a long night. Here's more caffeine in your coffee. Great. If you're the brand leader, that works really well. If you're the challenger, just repeating that formula won't work. You need to step outside of that. Tell the world about what it is that you believe, what change you're trying to make happen, and recruit advocates as a consequence. And they will then become your marketing department for you, the people out there with whom you've connected at the level of values. And the fourth thing is just maintaining the challenge. Being a challenger brand is about, it's a verb. I am a challenger brand. We are challenging. And there are all kinds of can't because reasons that are going to come and invade your world. We can't do this because. The challengers win and continue to success and navigate their way up that S-curve that Paddy talked about by adopting a can-if mentality. We can if. And being really creative in the face of constraints to, to uh, maintain their challenge. So that's the structure of the presentation. I'm going to talk about a couple of cases in a moment. But before we proceed, I don't want to assume that everybody's just buying into this notion. Yeah, challenge run, let's do it. Let's talk just a little bit more about why. What's the business case? for being a challenger, for adopting this methodology. And the first thing I want to talk about is inertia and the law of increasing returns. So in the data, we can see what I charmingly refer to after a conversation with my mother where she talked about, you know, the ads that I really like, Mark, is the Duracell bunny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the penny. It's the Energizer bunny, Mom. But the problem with the Duracell bunny moment, is everybody remembers the brand leader as being the battery company. Anytime any piece of communication comes out about a battery company, odds are that the brand leader is going to get attribution for that. And that's a real problem for everybody in this room if you're doing something that's even remotely close to what your big fish competitor is doing. They're going to get the credit for all the stuff you do. So you have to step outside of that and do something very different to break the inertia, to stop the black hole that sucks so all the ideas towards it, the black hole created by the market leader. The second reason why you need to be a challenge brand is the consumer and the audience isn't. We talk, we marketers, about the consumer. The consumer is a human being going through their day, concerned about getting to the kids to school drop off on time, whether or not they're going to get promoted at the office, whether or not they're going to make it back in time to watch Game of Thrones. They are not a consumer. They are a human being who actually doesn't care that much about consuming. And they're certainly not an audience either. When they're sitting in front of that computer screen and up pops your offer, they'd rather that not be there. And we deceive ourselves when we think about consumers and audiences as people who are willingly playing the game with us. That's why challenger brands need to be really distinctive in the marketplace and insist, insist that people pay attention to them. And the third reason is, is this is, reflects what we were talking about a little bit last night, um, Vinod, about unreasonableness. We live in an era now where we have trained consumers and customers to be incredibly unreasonable. So now we expect amazing Wi-Fi going 500 miles an hour at 30,000 feet for free, don't we? And that 
proposition carries over to every other category too. We're training unreasonable consumers. It used to be that a sports car that went really quick was great, but it wouldn't be green, would it? There was a Prius over here, and there was a Ferrari over here. And now there's a Tesla that's brought these two very unreasonable things together. You can now have the fastest sports car, and it be green. Uniting these poles that used to be in very different places, and we used to position our brand based on speed, or based on economy, or green, and now we can do both. The consumer is driving unreasonable into every category across the world. And the job of the challenger is to the, be the first person to meet those unreasonable demands. So that's why a challenger, and that's why if you thought this is what positioning and marketing was all about, and I'm sure you've seen some version of this at some point, you maybe even have one for your company, for your brand, that is no longer enough. It's important to think through that logically, but that will not work for you. You need to think in a, like a challenger brand, and you need to put this single defining idea of the lighthouse identity, what your brand stands for, its point of view, at the center of every single thing you do. So I'm going to show you some cases of challenger brands. It's not marketing wrapping paper we're talking about here. It's at the very essence of who you are, what you're about, and what you're trying to make happen in the world. So that's the structure uh, of the four things. I'm going to come back and show you some case studies against this in a moment. But first, I'd like to share with you a film. It's a three-minute edit, little sound bites from all these CMOs and CMOs that we've interviewed, telling us about why they're, what is their challenge and how they've managed to succeed. Let's give it that a listen right now. We've definitely thought of ourselves as a challenger brand, as a sort of outsiders that were taking a fresh look at an industry that we felt needed massive change. There's a very rigid segmentation. This is a rum, this is a whiskey, this is a gin. And uh, I found it very easy to go in and just mess with that because no one had. No one thought you know, anyone in the world would go and stay with you know, someone in their home. That it was such a, you know, a scary idea. Uh, and we proved that actually it's not a scary idea. It's something that people want to be doing. You know, there's a lot of old truths and myths out there that luxury brands need to represent old times and old days. And we think the exact opposite. We think it's very important to be of the times. There's been a lot of different kind of hotel uh, experiences, a lot of different designs, but always based on the five star. And we never understood why certain things had to be that way. Our biggest mission when we set up our company, and it's still our biggest mission today, is just to make other people as passionate about great craft beer as we are. It's a company that is really about the relentless pursuit of the truth. Our entire sort of mission around this is to tell a truthful and unbiased account of the things that matter in the world today. We're gonna to go and try and get 400 people their jobs back. That's why we wanna go and start yeah, a great global denim company. I looked at oral care I saw oral scare. Everything was driven by fear and shame. In a more enlightened age and day, you don't have to talk that way to get people to get excited about your product. You have to actively focus on culture and uh, specifically roll out your core values as soon as possible, ideally day one. Start small and make it good. It made so much sense to me and it completely changed how I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to do. Really, we never lost the sort of, you know, we're, we're the small guy challenger mentality and, and you know, part of my job is to make sure we never do. So, as you can see, quite a variety of different styles of challenger, but they're all pursuing these same four ideas here that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to double click on a couple of them. One is Warby Parker. It's a famous one, it's kind of um, well known, I would think, in this room. And it's disrupting and being a challenge at the level of business model as well as marketing. And then I'm going to talk to you about one you probably won't have heard of unless you're into uh, esoteric British craft beers. I'm um, talking about Brewdog, which you might be, and you should be. Um, so Warby Parker, what are they doing? How let's unpack and use this model so we can hopefully just make this clear and think about your own version of this as we go through this. Where is intelligent naivety in the way you're thinking about your category? 
And what is it telling you about how to introduce a new type criteria of choice? So we all know that Warby was created by some guys. One of them lost his $800 pair of designer glasses on a camping trip, and he's immediately pissed off. And they start asking these questions about how come it's so expensive? There's the first instance of intelligent naivety. They're asking questions about a category. None of them have any experience in it, but they're all curious about um, the conversation about why it looks the way it does. And it looks the way it does because it's, there's a duopoly of big companies who are dominating the way that category works. And they see so many opportunities where it's ripe for reinvention, where they can introduce new criteria of choice into this category and change the way people think about it. They start thinking about all the conventions, of course. Well, you know, at, at least to begin with, no stores. They have a few stores now, and they're doing very well. But no stores and a single price point. The whole category is these. Every pair of lenses in the lens craft is a different price point. They're trying to get you to shop it. $99. Signals immediately. Interesting. Something's going on here. They're all the same price. What's that about? There's another piece as a marketer that I really enjoyed, which was the way that they chose to use the annual report at Warby Parker. So they're not just breaking the conventions in the, in the experience of the purchase of these glasses, but they're breaking conventions in the way they think about presenting themselves to the world. This is a single page from their annual report. It talks about their own uh, culture, playing in a basketball, uh, New York City startup basketball tournament, how many tweets they put out a week, some of the best images from Instagram, uh, what their square footage per store is, Katie Couric doing gang signs, the best day in Warby Parker's sales history was the day after this annual report came out. Because they're thinking is a challenge about telling people about what they believe in, all their stories that they've, they're working so hard to make themselves distinctive in the marketplace. Let's share that. And it works. It went viral. It went, people wanted to know about it. One of the reasons why Warby found it hard to get started initially, at least as Neil uh, Blumenthal tells the stories, it's quite hard to raise money for an online glasses company, because conventional wisdom, a lot of it coming from investors, saying to them, well, you can't sell glasses online because people need to try them on, right? That, the experience we've all had, those of us in the room who wear glasses, you go in, you're pulling four, three or four pairs off the, off the shelves there, you're asking your friend, your spouse, what do you think, what should be to the best ones? Lots of can't because thinking could have blocked this idea, but they said, well, we can if, we send five pairs of glasses to people's homes. And we do the home try-on program. And we encourage people to take photos of themselves, to put it out there on the web, to share madly. This is how this brand became famous. So refusing to accept that they, couldn't, they had to do it the same way as it's always been done, embracing the constraint, leaning into it, doing the home trial kit, and there it is. And when you look at a Warby's website, they'll tell you what they believe in. They'll say, we believe that buying glasses should be easy and fun. It should leave you happy and good looking with money in your pocket. We also believe that everyone has the right to see. So this is a group that have worked very hard to develop their belief system. And I was very struck yesterday, because I'm tuned to listen to this kind of thing, just how many of the speakers up on the stage here started sentences with, well, you know, we believe that. So the guy from um, Nutanix talked about Many times when he started this conversation, well, we believe at Nutanix that, da, da, da. Getting clear on what it is that you believe is really important to drive your brand and how it behaves in the marketplace, really important for your culture too. So that's the sort of structure, interpreted post hoc for Warby Parker, about how to build a challenger brand. Where's intelligent naivety? How is it informing how you're reinventing the category? What conventions can you break? What is your belief system that you're projecting out there to the world to engage people with? And how do you adopt a kind of mentality to solving the problems that a kind of the brand leader wouldn't go out and solve because it's difficult? Here's my uh, esoteric Scottish craft beer. So let's practice this and put ourselves in the position of it. It's 2007. You're living at the very tippy top of Scotland. And you're really into beer. And your local pub has what you consider to be a dreadful choice. And the moment of intelligent naivety is, what happened to beer in the UK? We used to be so good at this, and now the choice seems to be Stella or Heineken. And you're pissed off in the same way that um, the Warby Parker guys were pissed off about losing their beer, uh, losing their glasses. So here's the founder, James Watt, of 
a, a brand called BrewDog, fastest growing package good brand in the UK two years in a row. Listen to the way he talks about the mission that he's on and what it is they're trying to do and some of the things they've done to make their mission really visible in the world. Our biggest mission when we set up our company and it's still our biggest mission today is just to make other people as passionate about great craft beer as we are and show people there is an alternative to the mainstream, industrial, monolithic, insipid, bland, tasteless, apathetic beers that dominate the market. They spend so much money in advertising, market, and trying to convince people that's what good beer is, and sadly, so many people have fallen down this rabbit hole. We set up with no money, with no budget, and we've had to be quite inventive as to how we get our name out there. In the last five years, we've made the strongest beer on the planet. We've packaged beer in roadkill and taxidermy. We've fermented a beer at the bottom of the sea. We've made a special beer with banned substances for the Olympics. But they've all been done because it gives us a platform to get our ideas across about beer. So we made a 18.2% beer called Tokyo. There was a huge media backlash. I was in Channel 4 News. I was interviewed by loads of major newspapers. And the people that saw that coverage, maybe it just gets them starting to think, well, beer doesn't have to start with Heineken and end with Stella. There is maybe a different approach to beer and get them into good beer that way. So, you know, why on earth would they do something like this? It's kind of preposterous. And at one level, of course, it's a publicity stunt, right? We can all look at it and dismiss it as a publicity stunt. But the truth of the matter is, they're using this to reveal their bigger agenda about how they feel beer has gone wrong. And they're using it to create advocates. So I just, you know, it's, incidentally, it's, it's, um, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records very briefly as the strongest beer ever made. It really pissed off the Germans, because they were the previous record holder. So they go out and brew a new beer, come back and say, now we're the strongest beer in the world. And these guys get, and this thing goes round and round, and they're getting all the media attention. Just as they're getting all the, my, my favorite version of one of these is, is the, uh, never mind the anabolics beer, <laughs> the London Olympics, a very prestigious thing, and a bunch of Scots going, right, we're going to brew a beer with banned substances, guaranteeing their media coverage. But again, why is it so important that they do this kind of thing? As Adam says, the greatest risk to challenges is not rejection, but indifference. It's when you come out with all the stuff you've worked so incredibly hard on, the world greets it with a big, Meh. If they do meh, you lose. And so there's a line, isn't there? And I bet you may have confronted this already. There's a line. And on this side of the line is all kinds of reasonable behavior by all kinds of reasonable people trying to build reasonable brands. It's what brand leaders do. They've no reason to toe that line, step over that line into the unreasonable place, and do stuff that maybe scares you, maybe polarizes the world out there and divides the world into two kinds of people, those you with and those who are against you. That's what challenger brands need to do. That's how they win. Think about this. Next time you're approving an idea about a product feature set or a marketing program, is it unreasonable enough? Is it crossing that line? Are we going to make ourselves famous? One last word about these guys. So they started in 2007. We all know what happened in 2008. They've got a growing brand, they've got some attention, and now they can't raise any money. We can't expand the brewery because, of course you don't have that mentality, we can if we do a crowdfunding uh, campaign. We ask our early fans to lend us some dough to build out this beer. And they've done four rounds of this now, raised 45 million pounds. And they're coming to America. They've just raised enough money they can build a brewery in Ohio. So pretty soon you'll get to drink tactical nuclear penguin yourselves, if you've got the stomach for it. And that's what happens as a consequence, their sales. So again, let's just break it down so it becomes really clear and we can practice this when we go back. Intelligent naivety, beer, what is going on? What's your equivalent of that? When you look at the category, what is going on? What makes you mad? What are you outraged by? How do you then break conventions? What's your version of tactical nuclear penguin or the end of history or whatever? Leading with beliefs, I love that bit where he starts ranting, right, about bland, insipid, tasteless, apathetic. He's pissed off about it, and he can raise money because enough people are also pissed off about it. 
Um, maintaining intelligent naivety. Many of you will have had this when you started your business. It's probably what gave you the inspiration for it. How do you maintain it? Continually asking yourself, what's wrong with this category? What's, what's pissing us off? Asking the dumb questions, challenging assumptions, auditing your category. Just put a bunch of, this is what the competitors are doing in terms of product, in terms of marketing. How do we do the opposite? And borrow the codes of other categories. If you see somebody else's category and you think, that's on fire, that's interesting, what's going on there? Borrow it. So there's a brand called Lush in the personal care products. Started by three guys who left Body Shop. They said they were tired of working at Anita Roddick's Green Library. Boring, too many rules, have to keep your voice down. What's a great category that we love? Oh, we love going into Whole Foods. It's colorful. It's this multi-sensory experience. What if personal care looked like that plus that? So what's that for you? What are the interesting categories that you can borrow codes from? And if you did, what might it look like in the user experience? Really easy way to maintain um, this sense of intelligent naivety and channel your founder's instincts. It's amazing to me how categories all have it. Look at this. It's like they all got together and said, yeah, we're all going to do the same thing. You get George, and we'll get the tennis player from Switzerland. And then somebody else comes along and says, no, Detroit is where watches. Detroit? Detroit. Watches don't come from Detroit. That's the challenge of brand insight. The beauty industry. It's got to be a starlet. And your product goes in the bottom right hand corner. Unless you're Mac Cosmetics, where technically not even a woman, RuPaul, and a country singer who's also a lesbian. Very different way of thinking. I mean, this is obvious. I'm choosing the most telegraphic examples here. Every category has uh, their conventions. And there's so many different ways to be a challenger brand in the, in the category. So Dove is a classic challenger brand that's created 20 million likes on Facebook, and it sells soap. There's no such thing as boring categories. There's only boring marketing and boring brands and boring products. So how can you dial it up? And I loved listening to the previous speaker talk about stories and conflict and tension. This is so important to understand. Where is the conflict in my story? Because it's the story that makes it interesting. Without Voldemort, it's just a bunch of kids pretending to be wizards. Without a big bad wolf, it's just a walk in the woods. Where's the monster? Where's the tension? Where's the pain? So the last thing I'll leave you with here is to talk about the lighthouse identity and getting clear on what it is you believe and getting clear on what monster it is you're taking on on behalf of the community you serve. So the question becomes, we are blank and we believe that. We are dove and we believe beauty comes in all shapes and sizes and we're taking on the beauty myth. We are Audi, and we believe that luxury has got stuck, and luxury must progress. We believe, as Virgin America, it's time to put glamour back into flying. And Millwood Brown, the, the, the large market research institute, studied high-growth brands in the last 10 years and concluded that purpose-driven brands are the ones that are growing. And this phrase I love, which is something to think about, it's no longer what we buy, of course it's what we buy on some level, no longer just what we buy, it's what we're buying into. If I'm going to give you my hard-earned dough, then I need to know that we're aligned on values. And that's what impact investing is, I believe. And the data's in that this stuff grows brands. And that's my four points about challenger brands to take away. And if, we, if you come this afternoon for the workshop, we'll go a little bit deeper on each of these. But again, how? Are you changing the choice criteria in the category, introducing something new? How are you breaking the conventions to signal? You're not the market leader, you're the thought leader. What are your beliefs that this all allows you to represent to the world? And how are you adopting a CANIF mentality to knock over the many obstacles that will be put in your way to making that happen? That's, in a nutshell, Challenger Brands. Thank you. Yes, Vinod. Mark, we often hear people assume branding is for consumer companies. Yes. We hear branding is for consumer companies. Obviously, it's important for consumers, but it's important for everyone. Can you comment outside of the consumer domain? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a bias in our business. We're built around consumer marketing primarily. 
Um, but we have worked in the B2B world and we have worked in tech and I believe that these principles that are in play here are just the common principles of this B2P, it's business to people. How is it that you get people to respond to your story, to your message, to your beliefs? How do you get them to pay attention to you in a world that they uh, have got a thousand other things to do? So these principles, even though they're driven primarily by the insights we've received from uh, talking to consumer brand marketers, I know work in any domain because it's fundamental human truths we're talking about here. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat>